This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Uh, welcome to another episode of Audible Bleeding. Today, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Edward Wu on the podcast. He is the chairman of the Department of Vascular Surgery at MedStar Health in Washington, D.C. He's also a professor of surgery at Georgetown University. He went to medical school residency and fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania and served on staff as a vascular surgeon before moving to Washington, D.C. At MedStar, he built an entire division of vascular surgery and was responsible for interviewing and hiring many surgeons across multiple hospitals. We are honored to have him on the podcast today to give advice to graduating fellows on how to find a job and negotiate a contract. Welcome, Dr. Wu, uh, to Audible Bleeding. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Dr. Wu, just uh, to get our listeners to know you a little better, could you tell us about your training and how you chose vascular surgery? Uh, so I did a uh, went to medical medical school, obviously, and then did a traditional general surgery residency with a, even a two year lab rotation. Um, I was leaning towards cardiac uh, surgery earlier on and then um, did a vascular rotation early on uh, in my as my first rotation when I first got out of the lab and just loved it. I thought it was really, uh, you know, kind of span the breadth of of all different types of surgical procedures. Um, what was interesting to me was that you would operate on all different parts of the body. So it was hard to really get rote in terms of, um, you know, doing the same procedure in the same place again and again and again. And probably the most interesting thing was that I thought that the vascular surgeons were on the forefront of uh, cutting edge technology. I mean, that was at the time when really the endovascular evolution was taking place and it was, um, it was really satisfying to see that the surgeons were leading this, uh, this charge rather than being led by someone else. Dr. Wu, could, this is John Daber from uh, the, one of the senior fellows at NYP. Uh, hey, John. I, could you uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what your job at, at MedStar entails and sort of the, the difference between uh, MedStar and Georgetown? So MedStar Health is a large nonprofit organization that owns 10 hospitals across the uh, mid-Atlantic region. So we have five uh, around the, uh, I'm sorry, six around the DC region, um, five acute care hospitals and one rehab hospital, and then four in Baltimore. And uh, Georgetown University Hospital is just one of our hospitals uh, in our system. The two large tertiary or quaternary hospitals are Georgetown University Hospital and MedStar Washington Hospital Center. And then there are, are uh, seven other uh, community, more like community type programs uh, surrounding uh, the greater region. Um, MedStar Union Memorial Hospital is our hub in Baltimore and MedStar Washington Hospital Center is our hub in DC. So we kind of have two central hubs for heart and vascular program uh, in, uh, through MedStar separated by uh, region. My job entails both uh, administrative and clinical responsibilities. So I still operate a fair amount. Uh, I think it's important that you do that uh, no matter what position you're in. Uh, but uh, another part, portion of my job is administrative, where uh, when I first came here was to build out the vascular program. Um, and now we're, you know, we've built it out, but we continue to grow, continue to hire, look for new opportunities to uh, develop the program. So two kind of discrepant uh, um, uh, jobs that, that uh, both obviously entail a lot of work, uh, but keep, keep me very interested uh, uh, and uh, busy all day. So, Ed, you know, you've done a lot of recruitment, and I, I'm privy to this because I've known a couple of people you've recruited in the time. What are you looking for when you're looking for a hire? Like, uh, you know, any any general qualities that our, our fellows need to know so that they can make themselves, a, a, you know, attractive uh, applicants? Sure. I think it's important to come from a good program. That, that definitely shows that someone's going to have a good background of training. Um, I think that getting referrals from someone like yourself, Sharif, is uh, is really just hard to uh, beat. That That is, uh, you know, a good referral from a good friend is, you know, you know that that person is going to be excellent. And, uh, you know, the referrals that you've given have all been outstanding. So I think any, anyone that you want to suggest any time. <laughs> um, <laughs> another thing that's important, right, I think, good. is, <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, 
the the other thing that I would suggest is that that person is going to fit in with the group. Um, and, you know, different things, you know, different groups, I think, have different personalities and different people will fit into different groups. And, and understanding what your current group is and trying to get a sense of what that person is like uh, to make sure that everything is uh, is cohesive. Otherwise, it can be very difficult. And that's not to say that the group's got a problem. That's not to say that the person you're trying to hire has a problem. It's just that maybe their personalities don't, don't mix and match. Great. Dr. Wu, uh, what are some important considerations, uh, specifically non-financial factors uh, that fellows should take into account when applying for jobs? Sure. So I think there are a bunch of things. The first is you want to think about whether or not you want to do private practice or academics. And, I, and we can go into a lot more detail uh, in terms of that if you want. Uh, in general, though, other than the, the you know, kind of the big, the big fork of determining whether you want to do private or academics is um, looking at things like you know, the collegiality in the program, uh, what are the partners like? Are they all functioning independently and don't like each other or do they all work together and support each other? Um, what is the physical plant like in the area and, or, or the, you know, the hospital or the health system? Is it really run down? Uh, is it nice and new? Are there a lot of resources? Uh, those things can make a difference in terms of your job and, and your job satisfaction. The geographies can be very important. Do you want to be in the Northeast? Do you want to be on the West Coast? Do you want to be in the South, Mid-Atlantic? And then in addition to that, where do you have families and friends so that you can have support uh, that will, I think, make your life uh, richer and, uh, more sat and, and lead to more satisfaction? Because there's always going to be more than just the job. And, I, I, you know, these kinds of things can, can make a difference. Are you an outdoor person that you're going to want to be able to go on bike paths and run? Or are you a city person and you want to be very urban? And then I think more pertinent to the job is what are the current referral patterns? Uh, are the, all the referrals going to vascular surgery? Are those cardiology or interventional radi radiology dominate the, uh, the location? Um, is it completely saturated? Are there opportunities to grow? So these are all things that you want to look into to see um, whether or not you're going to be happy with that job. And I, I would even argue that these things are probably more important than the financial components because the financial components will change depending upon your success uh, within that job. Dr. Wu, do you uh, see any common mistakes that graduating fellows make when they're on the hunt for a job? Sure. Uh, I think the biggest one is to look at the short-term prospects. So a lot of times I'll see fellows uh, go and, and become enticed and take a job where the money, the starting salary is high and uh and they think that that's really all that matters and and they don't look at the whole picture a lot of things that i look that i just mentioned uh, earlier and or uh what the kind of future prospects are so there there's always the bait and switch where you go into this hospital or health system where they offer you a high salary to start and then in two or three years the contract changes and then they've got you basically stuck or you, you know or you have to look for another job and so i think it's really important to not um, get totally caught up in that initial salary and think more about the whole bigger picture as well as what the future is going to be because that can get you into a bad situation. You know, and I, I like the point you made earlier about looking at the physical plant because it, in, in a sense you get a sense of how committed the administration is to your division. So right. are there any uh, major red flags you would uh, tell people to go out for when, when evaluating potential jobs? Uh, in terms of physical plant or, or altogether, are you saying? Or just in general, in general, all, all, anything. Sure. I, I think in general, if it's too good to be true, you have to worry a little bit, right? And it, and it may just be that it's really good. But I think if it is too good to be true, then you want to dig a little bit deeper and try to figure out, you know, is this a bait and switch type of situation? Um, number two, I think that you really kind of want to take a look at um, – what's going on there and what's happened. So, you know, have there been multiple people that have come in and out of that job? So, uh, you know, every two or three years, there's a new hire and, uh, and um, you know, you're the next person that they're trying to recruit. That's always a little bit worrisome. Um, I think you want to look at, look at the, uh, um, the uh, interactions between the various surgeons or partners that are there and see uh, how that is because, Really, I think that if you can't get along with the people that you work with, it 
will make your daily life difficult. And then again, the, you know, the physical plant, like you said, Sharif, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of um, you know, what is the investment towards your program? If there's just kind of nothing, the offices are run down, the, the vascular lab is, you know, has an ultrasound from 20 years ago and they won't, you know, you can't get a new one. Um, you know, you're working with an OEC 9600, which I'm not even sure they make those anymore. I mean, you got to look at these things. I mean, if there's no investment into the program, you're really not going to succeed. Great. Uh, Dr. Wu, you know, it is important, though, to, to determine, you know, what salary is appropriate. How, how as a graduating fellow, do you find out kind of what an appropriate starting salary is? And, and then to add on to that, what is the best compensation model that, you know, a system, I know that's probably controversial, but when looking for a job, um, how do you tell your fellows to, to look into that? Sure. So I think in terms of what's a good starting salary, you, you know, there's published data out there, um, you know, MGM, MGMA and, and, and other uh, uh, standardized uh, collections of salaries looking at both geography and level. Um, the other thing to do is to ask around, um, ask people who have just graduated um, and, uh, and, and mentors as well. There will be some some differences between um, you know academics versus private practice, and certainly geography. Uh, you know, a salary in Alaska is not going to be the same salary as you know Washington D.C. probably because they may be you know they may need to recruit more heavily in Alaska. So um, so you got you have to look at each thing and, and you know the the uh, potential contributing factors that may change it. Now, in terms of what's the best compensation model, I, I think that. You want to go into a system uh, where you can get paid by RVUs, ideally. Um, but again, this kind of changes between private practice and, and working for a health system as an employed ph physician or employed surgeon. In private practice, uh, most of the time, there may be some, you know, most of the time, what your compensation is going to be, is going to uh, uh, consist of is basically the dollars that you collect. There may be some stipends that are offered for administrative positions that you work with the hospital for, um, but for the most part, it's a matter of dollars that you collect. And so your compensation is going to be based upon that. If you're going to go into an employed uh, model, I think getting paid by on an RVU basis is the best thing that you can do because uh, it's not dependent upon the dollars that you necessarily bring in. And as a result, you're not worried about things like what type of insurance or even whether or not the patients have insurance. You're not worried about the collections. You leave that up to the health system. You just really have to worry about doing your job and doing your procedures and your cases and taking care of the patients and, uh, and you know, striving for the best quality that you can have. And, and I think that that takes that financial aspect out of it, which is nice. So Dr. Wood, to add on to that, you hear of a lot of uh, starting bonuses and things like that. How do uh, bonuses, both starting and kind of RVU bonuses, uh, how, how do these figure into the salary? So every place is different. And I think that ultimately you just have to figure out what your total comp is um, and, and whether or not you're okay with the way the structure is designed to basically distribute your total comp. So in some places, uh, they can have higher base salaries um, and then uh, the bonus structure is very low or, or minimal. Um, and then in some places, the base salaries could be lower, but higher bonus structures. Um, and, you know, whether the bonuses are paid quarterly, monthly, annually, semi-annually. So really, it just comes down to how you want to manage things. In the end, again, it comes down to total comp and um, and it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, you can go to a place where, you know, you have a high base salary and you think, oh, well, you know, I, I have a really high base salary. This is great. Um, you know, my, even though my bonuses are low, maybe I don't have to be as productive. If, if you're not productive, that base salary is not going to last. So really what comes, what it comes down to is um, what your total comp is and, and just looking at how it gets distributed and what works for you and your family. Um, Dr. Wu, uh, how how long is an initial contract uh, generally for coming straight out of fellowship? Typically, they're uh, two to three years. Um, and you know, again, you want to think about, I think, when you take your first job in longer horizons than that. I think if you're jumping around in two to three years, uh, it doesn't look good. It's probably not good for you and your family either. 
And so if you're thinking about um, if you're thinking about a job in that time horizon, I think you're probably not seeing it quite right. You should really be thinking more to, more or less five to ten years uh, uh, in terms of those types of time horizons. So the initial contract really is just something to kind of lock you into place to ensure that it gives you some um, some safety net because you're going to have you know initial years where you have to build up your practice and you are probably not going to justify your salary in the beginning. So if you get into a, you take your first job and there's only a one year contract for X dollars, uh, and then in your second year you're expected to be completely productivity based, that's probably not a great thing because there's a reasonable chance you may not be making those dollars and you want to have at least again some floor to ensure that you have um, you know certain certain level of total compensation for the first few years to be safe. Great, uh, and we know it's not all about. You know the money there's a lot of benefits that contribute to kind of your overall job prospect um what when you're counseling your fellows what benefits do you tell them to look at such as roth ira tenure health dental insurance disability and how common are these nowadays to be included in contracts so that changes a little bit again between private and employed um in the private groups, there's a little bit more freedom in terms of being creative and what you can do with, say, Roth IRAs, partner sharing, um, uh, things like that. Uh, in employed situations, it's much more um, structured because there's a huge number of employees that are usually within the system and every employee has to be essentially offered the same plan. So at the very least, you should have clearly health and dental insurance um, there should be some type of retirement contribution. So uh, 403B or 401K, depending on whether it's a for-profit or not, uh, not for profit. Um, ideally, there should be some type of matching. Um, you know, so you contribute a certain amount and then your employer or group employ, uh, contributes a certain amount. The Roth IRA is, it just, again, it's just a different way to be able to put money uh, aside. Uh, the difference between a, um, a Roth IRA and a standard IRA, so a standard IRA or like a 403B or 401K is, a, is deductible from your, uh, your, your income taxes. So you put that money away, but then you pay your taxes uh, when you eventually take this money out when you retire and at a time when, in theory, your tax rates are lower. The Roth IRA is different in that you take that money out and it's um, post-tax, so you actually pay taxes on it at the time you pay your current rates. But then any investment gain that you make on the on, on that um, on that investment is is tax-free in the future. So there's clearly benefits to one and the other. Um, in terms of tenure, I think that tenure is really just kind of a thing of the past. Um, Tenure is really only offered for um, uh, basic science type of uh, tracks at uh, large academic uh, institutions. And typically the tenure dollars associated with that are very low. Um, and so you know, if you lost all your privileges and, and basically only had your tenure, you, it's the money's not high enough that you'd really be able to support yourself or, or your family. So it's really, I think, more of a thing in the past. What about uh, malpractice insurance? Is this is that typically covered uh, by the practice, or, um, or or are there some situations where you have to do that yourself? So I think if you get into a single or dual practice, you may be in a um, dual, single or dual private practice. You might be required, obviously, a single practice. Uh, you might be required to cover yourself. In a group, um, uh, it's usually something that's you know a shared uh, expense. In an employed uh, model. The malpractice should uh, be there. If it's not, then I think that would be a red flag uh, that uh, Sharif was talking about earlier, because something's not right if you're going into an employee model and they're not covering your uh, malpractice insurance. I think the 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 thing that to be careful with with malpractice insurance, uh, if at all possible, you want to make sure you have a tail, and a tail simply means that it's it's event based. So um, if you leave a um, if you leave a practice or uh, a, you know a group or a health system, uh, every event or every uh, everything that you practice for each patient is covered, because typically there's a um, there's a statute of limitations. So depending upon where you are, it can be two to three years. 
So the amount medical malpractice suit just has to be filed within two to three years of discovery, not necessarily of the incident, but of discovery. And so, uh, you know, you could find yourself in a situation where you've moved on for several years and then there's a lawsuit that comes to you. Uh, and if you're not event based, if you don't have that tail, you're going to have to cover that yourself, which is a bad situation. So if you if you're if you join a practice and there's not a tail, you should try to negotiate it uh, or, you you know, when you leave that that practice, if you ever do, you have to purchase the tail to cover cover yourself. Great. One uh, issue that's very pertinent to residents and fellows nowadays is uh, student debt. Are there any, have you heard of any uh, compensation plans that include, whether it's employed or academic, where they have some sort of loan repayment options? Definitely. So <clears throat> there are definitely um, programs that offer that. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, kind of, it's almost an interest uh, free loan, essentially what it is. And, and usually what it is, they'll pay uh, some amount of your debt or maybe all of your debt, but then require you to stay within a, um, to, you know, within the, the system or the group or whatever for a certain amount of period to fully vest. And if you leave early, then you would then owe that amount back to the practice or the system. Uh, they also have, you know, some places will offer uh, assistance with housing too. So uh, the ability to take out low or interest-free loans to help uh, with a down payment for a house. So it's always worth, worth asking. It's not prevalent. I don't think a lot of places offer it, but some places do. So, Ed, you know, a lot of our, our fellows who are graduating and, and, and negotiating for a first job, this is actually the first time in their life that they have to negotiate for anything because uh, they followed the path where they apply. But the, um, so how, how do they learn the skill of negotiating and any advice on how to get the most out of their opportunity? I think the most important thing about negotiating is understanding your own position basically understanding what is your worth at that time. Um, and then there are a couple other things to look at. Um, and, and it's really looking at what is your desire? How badly do you want that job or that position? And then trying to understand how much they want you uh, or, you know, or are in need of you or somebody like you. And when you figure out those three things, I think it gives you some sense of how much or how little you can negotiate. Uh, but it all comes down to really understanding that dynamic. If you don't understand that dynamic, then you're negotiating either in a position of false power where you think that you are more important or more worthwhile than, than you really are, or you're selling yourself short and, and negotiating for, from a point of weakness when you ne shouldn't necessarily uh, be in that position. So again, it's, it's, it's understanding you know, your, your worth um, how bad you want this position uh, and and how badly do they want you and um, and that makes all difference so I would say you know coming out of a, a training program um, your worth um, and no offense to you guys John and, and, and Kevin but you, you guys your worth is not the same as Dr. Alozi right and so Dr. Alozi <laughs> is gonna, <laughs> Dr. Alozi is going to be able to negotiate from a completely different vantage point than both of you. Um, at the same time, if you're looking at a place, you know, like five years ago when I started, when I came down to, to MedStar Health, I was charged with rebuilding this program and I wanted to do it quickly. And, you know, I wanted to get some new hires that were talented, uh, hard workers, uh, you know, Sharif helped me with that with one of, uh, uh, with a couple of new hires that I, I was able to, to bring on who were terrific. And so, um, you know, they had a little bit more negotiating strength because I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to build a program. I wanted to build it quickly. And they came with an extraordinary reference, you know, that i.e. their mentor. I don't really think like, anyone would ever you know. accuse Ed. I don't think anyone would ever accuse you of negotiating from, from a position of weakness, but uh, yeah. that's just my <laughs> <laughs> so, but You get the point, right? I, I mean, yes, ultimately yes. it's, it's um, you know, how badly do they want you and how badly do you want them? And, and, you know, what, what is your status? Great, that is a great insight. Um, one thing I've heard uh, some surgeons speak about is non-compete clauses. Are these common and are they negotiable? So they are more and more common now. Uh, when when I started working, when Sharif started working, I, I would bet that neither of us, I know I didn't have one, I bet Sharif probably didn't have a non-compete either. I, I'm sure, did you, did you have one when you when you first signed on? Not not when I started, but once I when I when I, once we started renegotiating contracts, that became sort of boilerplate. 
Right, right. And and now I think that most places will have a non-compete. I would find it pretty uncommon that you could find a job where there's a where there's no non-compete clause. So they're pretty prevalent. And they're um, tricky because they're not necessarily enforceable, but the, but it is it is a threat. Yes. Speaking of uh, <clears throat> of the contract, uh, should uh, uh, as a new hire, should you always hire a contract lawyer to to look over a contract, and and where should where should we go about finding someone to do that? <laughs> so I think that depends upon the job that you're taking. Um, in these bigger health systems, uh, the the language of the contract is pretty boilerplate, uh, and it probably doesn't matter too much whether or not you get a contract attorney. Um, you guys are all smart people. You can read it, understand, you know, what are some of the uh, uh, potential deficiencies within that contract and what are the things that you may or may not be looking for. But for the most part, again, they're pretty boilerplate uh, just because they have to be. They can't be offering different contracts to everybody. If you get into a smaller hospital, a smaller health system or a private practice, that may change. And so the contracts can be individualized and, and changed uh, in order to benefit the hiring party. Um, and so I think in those circumstances, you may want to get a, a contract attorney to really kind of look through and in depth that contract to ensure that there's no um, catch clauses that could get you into trouble, uh, you know, a few years down the line. In terms of where to find them, uh, the best thing to do is to ask ask um, your friends. And, uh, and often they can be local. So if you're coming out of New York City and you're looking for a job in, in California, then um, a New York contract attorney may not be helpful for, for understanding California contract law. So you would really want to ask your mentor or your friends uh, who you may know uh, in California, you know, who's a good contract attorney that can help you read through that language. Great. Uh, Dr. Wu, I was hoping you could help us understand uh, both the different you know, we, we all kind of understand the difference between academic and private, but this, the different pathways in an academic job, whether there's clinical versus tenure and how um, how this impacts your contract negotiation. Sure. Um, so to begin with the contract negotiation, again, I think that academic contract is pretty standard um, and pretty boilerplate. And so there's probably not a lot of room for negotiation. Um, there's always some room, but probably not a lot. When you get into a smaller private uh, practice group, there may be more room. And again, uh, the contracts are more individualized. And so you really want to understand uh, what your place is within that contract and what your place is within uh, that group. Now, looking at the two in terms of a career uh, pathway, I have always uh, advise my trainees that you should be thinking about 5, 10, 15, 20 year horizons and trying to figure out where you want to be at each of those points. So, you know, you're, you're a uh, graduating uh, trainee and you want to be thinking, what do I want to be five years from now? What do I want to be 10 years from now? Where do I want to be 15? Where do I want to be 20 years from now? And if you have a, at least some inkling of what you want to do, that will help you get to that point. If you really don't want it, if you really don't know, it's okay, it's fine, but it makes it a little bit harder for you to kind of get onto a path to get you into that position. So I would I would say that in most situations for private practice, you're looking for a, um, a pathway to become partner, and most likely you're going to hopefully get into a, a group that you really enjoy and probably spend the rest of your career and, and maybe even life in that geographic uh, location. Um, when you join a private practice, the idea is probably not to jump from practice to practice to practice, but to get there, develop a, your name, develop a reputation, um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, just you know, kind of make your life there. Academics is different. Um, you're looking potentially to, and it, it, it could be the same. You could be going and say, I'm going to join an academic place. I want to be employed. I want to be in a big city. I want to join this academic institution. I just want to spend the rest of my life there and, and, and you know, really just be a clinically busy surgeon. And that's totally fine. But a lot of people get into academics and they want to pursue that career of, of, you know, following a path of becoming a, you know, a director of a program or a program director or a director of the vascular lab. And then, you know, using that to step up, uh, you know, potentially a division chief, a department chair, um, you know, and, and, and maybe even more. And so um, that is 
dependent upon the person. But yeah, I think you, if you want to get on that path, you have to know that you want to do that and you have to kind of make the right moves to, to um, position yourself uh, to be able to climb that ladder. Yeah, that is great. W one question I have, I, I feel like I talk to a lot of fellows and, and colleagues of mine and it's kind of the same position I'm in. Um, do you need to be a research powerhouse to have a successful career in academia or can are there you know kind of educational and clinical pathways that will still allow you to um you know because some of us love the academic environment we love teaching and training and that sort of atmosphere but maybe aren't you know uh publishing 10 papers a year what kind of advice do you give to fellows that kind of would ask you that I would say that you can pave your own path uh, no matter what. And really the, um, the path to success is working hard, developing good relationships with people um, and understanding where you want to be so that you have a goal uh, to, uh, to attain. And there are multiple paths to get there. Um, some people are very, you know, clinically, or I'm sorry, very research oriented. So it can be clinical research, basic science or whatever. Um, you know, a lot of uh, clinical papers, you know, they can do large series, VQIs, or some people will be basic science researchers and have, uh, you know, R01 funding and, and, you know, other institutional funding and, 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 and develop their name that way. Um, other people will find um, pathways through education. Um, becoming a program director and, uh, you know, becoming both locally, you know, institutionally within their own hospital or system, uh, and then even more nationally become speakers about education and how to improve education and, and you know, be a proponent for trainees and, and such. And, and that's a pathway. And then there are pathways of, of just being really good at what you do, right? And so, you know, you come out and you're a really good vascular surgeon um, and people look to you you develop a great practice and you start leading uh, uh, your your program right you, you know you develop clinical pathways um, you become a mentor uh, you know people ask you for advice and, and and you develop relationships within your own hospital within your own health system and you develop a name um, as you know someone who's not only a great surgeon but a great leader just from that so I don't think there's a set path I think you can do you can climb that ladder any way you want to. Um, it's just understanding that you have to be good at what you do. I, I think that's good advice. I think the, the idea that you have to copy someone else's pathway to success is, is, is you're, you're bound to, you know, that's bound to not work for you. You know, you have to find your own way in some ways. Absolutely. Um, all right, Dr. Wu, before we, uh, before we pivot to other topics, uh, do you have any, uh, any last, thoughts uh, or advice to give uh, to fellows uh, on the job search or, or recommendations on, on, uh, on things that they should do? Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, I think we're really privileged to be vascular surgeons. Uh, it, it sounds kind of hokey, but, you know, it's, it's a great job. I mean, you affect people's lives every day. Um, and, uh, and you're saving people's lives every day. And it's, it's really, it's an honor and privilege. But I think, Beyond that, it's really important to have good work-life balance. Uh, you know, you're going to come out of, you, you, you know, we all we all kind of do the same thing, right? We go to undergrad, we work really hard to be, you know, pre-med, and then we go to med school and work really hard to get our residency, and then, you know, we go, get into our residency, work really hard to get our first job, and, and you're just... You, the pathway is so well-defined, and then you get out, and now you're in your first job, and they're, you know, those... Um, I guess those bumpers, if you will, are not there anymore, right? Because, you know, you, you really can't stray too much as an undergrad, a med student, or a resident. The, 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 the path in line is very clear. Once you get out, there's that path and those bumpers, those guys are not there so much. You're really on your own. And you can really get lost one way or the other. And I think it's really important to have good work-life balance because ultimately, you know, your happiness is going to be based upon that. I, I, I think I truly believe that people who are um, who are unable to have a good balance are unable to really you know find good happiness and that's that's really I think what you know what's important and they're really set up for burnout also I think yeah. I think it's very true what you said you know yes absolutely so Ed um, you know so we, we've talked mostly about like administrative uh, stuff for the entire podcast but 
you know, people who don't know you uh, don't know that you're a technically excellent surgeon. So uh, are there any tricks that you have that have gotten you out of trouble in the OR? Any little things you keep in the back of your pocket that uh, uh, when you get in the gym have, uh, have saved you in the past that maybe you can share with some of our listeners? Sure. I, I think that, um, and this is what I tell my trainees, write everything down. Um, when I was, uh, when I was an intern, I wrote reams. So every time I got into a case and I got out, I would just write and write and write as much as I could. By the time I was the chief resident, um, what I was writing about the cases were nuances. And then when I was a fellow and an attending, I wrote less and less. Um, and so what I wanted to do was basically call as much uh, data and information I could get from my mentors, knowing that you know when I was on my own, I was you know, people weren't going to teach me anymore. I think the other thing is you want to go into the cases and have those cases be uh, as rote as possible. So if you can do the case the same way every time, that's great. Because when you get into trouble in a case, then it's a minor uh, adjustment to what you're accustomed to doing. If you go in and you're not ready for those cases and you basically uh, and you approach the case like it's a new case every single time, that's when you're going to get into trouble. Because then if there's any variance from the norm and it gets a little bit uh, more hectic, then then you really can get into trouble. So, you know, I, I've been doing this a really long time and as, as uh, Dr. Lozi has as well. And um, I can tell you that when I, when I go into cases, uh, oftentimes the night before or the morning before, I'll actually in my mind just think about the, the steps of the procedure uh, even before, just before I scrub in, just so that, I, again, I know what I'm going to do so that it's, uh, I'm, you know, I don't forget something that becomes obvious, which then could potentially set me up for failure. It's funny. In the first couple of years of my practice, I would sometimes dream about the cases, you know? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. But, but like yeah. you go to, you go over in your head so much that, that it would be there, you know, in your subconscious. Yeah. Yeah, you got to think about it. I mean, that's just, and it's like, you know, when you go into a negotiation or, or, or you, when you go into a meeting, you don't go unprepared. You think about what you're going to say. If you guys go, when you go present at SVS, right, and, or, you know, or another meeting, and you're going to give a talk, you, you prepare for the talk and you prepare for the questions that they're going to ask you. You don't just go in and say, I'm going to wing it. I don't care what they're going to ask me or whatever. And I'm never going to look at the PowerPoint that I've just, you know, I put together. You go and you practice. You practice your talk. You practice your questions. You think about what they're going to do. You anticipate. I think you want to do the same thing for your operations because that's really, you know, that's how you can, that's how you succeed. Thanks, Dr. Wu. That's really great advice. Um, sure. uh, what do you think uh, young uh, trainees and junior faculty uh, should be, like, most excited about in the field of vascular surgery when starting their careers? I think that um, vascular gives you a, a nice balance of, um, you know, kind of traditional surgery um, and taking care of patients with, and at the same time has this whole potential of potential of possibly even reinventing itself. And so, you know, as we move more and more towards minimally invasive procedures, the vascular surgeons and the, you know, I would say the endovascular community have really embraced that. And so, I often think this, I don't know if Sharif, you can comment as well. I, I often wonder if, you know, 10 years from now, we're gonna be doing things completely differently than we're doing them, you know, as as we're doing them today. Absolutely. And, and six, I, I mean, think, when you, you finished your training, did you think your practice would be anything like it is now? No, <laughs> totally different, right? And 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 despite, despite appearances, you're not an old man, you know? So uh, it yeah. wasn't that long ago for me. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I feel like it though. My neck hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's, that's one of the great things about our field. It's just, there's, there's just so much invention, right. And, um, and so much technology that goes into it and you can play a big role in that. That's, that's no one's stopping you from being, a, a, you know, a, a contributor to that. Fantastic. And probably the hardest question of the day for you. Is there anything you know to be true that no one else agrees with you on? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know. That um, uh, I guess uh, that could happen probably daily with my wife. I think, but <laughs> <laughs> she's in the other well, we room. We right those arguments. Yes. She's gonna she's gonna kill me. <laughs> I, I think that honestly, um, to answer that question. Um, Success in life is is 
compromise in understanding other people's positions and having introspection. So I, I really feel that if you always or even sometimes feel that you're absolutely right and other people are not, it's a problem. You have to be able to understand why your position, uh, you know, why you feel the way you do and, you know, what are the strengths behind your position. But you also have to understand what are the weaknesses behind your position and why you might be wrong. And, and, and understand why somebody else feels that they're right. And ultimately, life is about compromise. If you, you know, it, it, very rarely um, are you in a situation where one person gets to absolutely dictate their position. Um, and if you feel that that's the way it should be, then you're probably not going to do well overall. You know, 40 years ago, it was a little, it was a little different, right? You, you're chairman of surgery or whatever, and, you know, everybody feared you. You could go around and yelling at everyone and, you, you know, just mandate ridiculous things and people are going to do it. That is not what society is today. Um, you really, it, it, our, our society, you know, locally, nationally, globally is all inter interconnected. And, and, and we thrive and succeed based upon understanding what other people think. And, and working with other people and compromising. That's the only way you move forward. If you if you have a unilateral position on something, it's not gonna work. So Ed, just the, you know, for our final question, now that you've got all these administrative duties, what, what's your what's your favorite part of the day? I mean, is it still operating? Is it uh, going home at the end of the day? What, 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 do you, what do you look forward to the most when you come to work? It's different every day. And that's the great thing about my job. And some days I just love and just want to operate. Um, sometimes I'm tired and, 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 you know, would rather be doing administrative stuff. Um, you know, you get, you can get kind of uh, maybe tired of doing the same operation again and again. And so I, I think what's great um, about what I get to do is I get to mix it up. And every week there's, you know, there's some of everything. And so it, it keeps me really interested. Dr. Wu, we can't thank you enough for spending your Sunday morning with us, giving us this uh, great advice. I, I know many fellows across the country are going to, to find this very helpful. And we're actually going to also uh, make this available for all the general surgery residents out there as to make it, most of it's very applicable to them also. Great. Um, well, thank you for me. Yeah, so uh, thank you. We look forward yeah, no, to yeah, thank uh, you very much. It's been great. talking to you some more in the future. Great. Thanks, guys, and good luck. Thank you for listening to Audible Bleeding. If you enjoyed this episode, please go on iTunes and give us a five-star rating and leave a review. If you want to connect with us, you can connect with us at our website at audiblebleeding.com or send us an email at audible.bleeding.podcast at gmail.com.